How could an island so seemingly sheltered by its hills be floored by floodwaters? Was it simply an unprecedented storm, or did Cebu's bones, its bedrock and slopes, conspire with the rains? Witnesses in Liloan, Talisay, Cebu City and nearby towns recall a wall of water rushing where none was expected. But digging into the details reveals that this disaster had a geological signature. Scientists and local experts now say that Cebu's rock and soil, cut by quarries and scarred by human use, dictated where the water ran, how fast it arrived, and how devastating it became. In short, the flooding was not random. It was written in the island's geology. In early November of the year 2025, Typhoon Kalmaegi, known locally as Tino, unleashed days of torrential rain over Cebu. In the 24 hours before landfall, the area around Cebu City saw roughly 183 millimetres, about 7 inches, of rain. That alone would swamp many places, but in Cebu the downpour collided with an unexpectedly fragile landscape. Within hours, multiple rivers, the Butuanon, Mananga, Kansaga, Kotkot and Sapangdaku, burst their banks. Flash floods quickly submerged areas in Cebu City, Talisay City, Mandawe City, Liloan and Consolacion, sweeping away homes, trucks and lives. By midweek, over 100 people were dead in the province, and thousands displaced. As one official put it, the water is what is truly putting our people at risk. Many survivors were stranded on rooftops or pulled from uprooted vehicles, asking themselves how this catastrophe could happen. Cebu was not known as a flood-prone place. In fact, it didn't even make the country's top ten flood-prone areas. Yet after Tino, it was a disaster zone. What went wrong? Part of the answer lies in Cebu's shape and subsurface. The main island of Cebu is a long, narrow spine of steep mountains and sharp ridges, oriented roughly north to south. From the interiors, rain runs off quickly into a network of rivers and creeks that gush down to towns and the sea. Underneath, much of the island is made of limestone, a soluble sedimentary rock dating back to Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. In fact, the Mines and Geosciences Bureau notes that at least 60% of Cebu lies on highly soluble limestone, creating classic karst terrain. Over millennia, water has eaten channels and caves into this limestone, yielding caves and sinkholes beneath the surface. In karst regions, heavy rains can collapse the ground. As scientists warn, intense flooding can trigger sinkholes when water fills underground voids. Although Typhoon Tino itself came more than a month after Cebu's late September quake, magnitude 6.9, the scene was already set. Many parts of northern Cebu were found to be karst, prone to underground cavity formation and collapse. That means the very ground underfoot was rotted with hidden tunnels and caves. It did not take much to let them swallow the surface. In the year 2018, for example, a huge limestone cliff in Naga City, just south of Cebu City, gave way in a massive landslide debris avalanche, largely because water had found its way into the limestone layers. Experts who studied that disaster note the rocks there, Pliocene-era limestone capped by weaker marls, can behave unpredictably when saturated. A crevice or thin clay bed can turn a stable slope into a run-out slide in minutes. During Tino, however, it was mostly water that surged where those voids lay. Sinkholes that had appeared during the quake may have widened. Flooding is well known to accelerate cast collapse. Geologists from the Mines and Geosciences Bureau warned recently that in Cebu, the cover of many sinkholes can give way under heavy rains, lowering the water table 
or pooling subterranean streams until the roof caves in. In other words, Cebu's cast terrain was like a ticking time bomb when these rains fell. Beyond caves and sinkholes, Cebu's bedrock structure amplifies floods in other ways. Most of the mountains are composed of sedimentary layers, often a hard limestone caprock over softer marl, a clay-rich limestone which dictates how water flows and how stable the hillsides are. Where hard rock is jointed or fractured, water pours straight down. Where a layer of clay underlies a porous limestone, as in many Cebu uplands, heavy rain fills the upper rock and then floods into the clay, increasing pore pressure until the slab slides. This was seen in the Naga landslide in September of the year 2018 and suggests that any strong rainfall is particularly dangerous on Cebu's slopes. In simple terms, the geology creates steep, slick slides. Rainfall runs off bare limestone much faster than a forest can absorb it. This geomorphology means rivers in Cebu respond extremely quickly to downpours. The major watersheds, Mananga and Sapangdaku, draining northwestern Cebu City and Talise, Kotkot, Kabadiangan and Jubai, draining northern Cebu City toward Liloan, the Butuanon, draining Cebu City and Mandawe, and Kansaga, draining Mandawe and Consolacion all flow rapidly from mountains to lowlands. When Typhoon Tino poured rain on the mountains, those rivers swelled in hours. As the provincial governor noted, winds were feared, but it turned out the water is what is devastating. In Liloan, Mayor Alju Frasco said the floodwaters came crashing down from Cebu City's uplands, spilling over highways and inundating homes, the worst flooding in our lifetime. Hydrogeologically, Cebu's ridges act like funnels. Two more examples, the Butuanon River is, in local terms, one of Metro Cebu's most flood-prone waterways. Money was spent on it over 11 billion pesos of flood control projects, yet on November 4th it simply overtopped its banks, sending a surge into Cebu City and Mandawe. Likewise, the small Kotkot River, winding through Compostela and Liloan, overflowed its embankments despite ongoing mitigation works. In each case, the bedrock and steep channel allowed virtually no delay, what fell as rain soon became a raging wall of water in the towns below. Yet geology alone did not make this calamity so deadly. Human activity has remade the geology of Cebu in recent decades, and that, too, proved written into the script. Cebu's mountains have been stripped bare by deforestation, mining and development, changes that reduce the soil's ability to hold water. Official data shows the island lost roughly 10,100 hectares, about 25,000 acres, of tree cover between 2001 and 2023, nearly a 5% decline, with new roads and buildings creeping even into the central Cebu protected landscape. As one analyst wrote this week, Cebu's hills are now bold and weakened. A student research group from Metro Cebu found that nearly a third of locals blamed improper waste disposal and even accumulation of waste-blocking drainage for their floods, a sign that without trees and intact soil, water had nowhere to go. Indeed, cleaning crews reported that Manila shore garbage and logs easily clogged narrow concrete canals and river mouths during Tino. Mining and quarrying have been equally disruptive. Cebu is one of the Philippines' leading sources of dolomite, limestone, sand and gravel. And for decades, big companies and small operators have been cutting into the mountains. A farmer organization points out that unregulated quarrying is ripping apart upland slopes. 
Hundreds of extractive leases were active in Cebu as of last year. Dolomite in Alcoy and Algao, limestone in Dalaguete and Toledo, sand and minerals in Balamban and Asturias, among others. This large-scale earth-moving can lower and sharpen slopes, making them more brittle when rains come. The causal effect is obvious. Quarry sites and cut slopes simply shed soil and rock into streams at the first sign of rain. Kodao Productions reports that months before the typhoon, even Cebu City councillors warned that unabated quarrying in upland barangays was loading the flood risk downstream. During Tino, workers videotaped muddy slurry flowing down from old quarry pits into the river network. Sediment and boulders from those sites have raised riverbeds and narrowed channels over time, so rivers now take much less water before bursting out. Illegal extraction worsens the picture. In western Cebu's Toledo City, officials have just suspended hundreds of informal sand and gravel pit diggers in the Hinulawan River, citing fear that haphazard digging weakens the soil and damages the river. Such unregulated activity is known to destabilize riverbanks and upland slopes, worsening disaster risks like erosion and flooding. In a county short on jobs, every stream bed is being harvested to sell construction sand, a human cast of pickaxes and tunnels. The result is that during Tino, many rivers were already clogged or structurally unsound. In one Talise city shantytown under the Mananga River Bridge, houses literally eroded away by the sudden surge. It is the same story on the Kotkot. Locals had long complained that erosion from quarries up country was choking their river, turning even a moderate rain into a deluge. Rapid urbanization compounded these effects. Cebu's population boomed in recent decades, with subdivision sprawl up to the hillsides and new neighborhoods blocking ancient floodways. As Bachayam Barangay officials noted after Tino, informal settlements had encroached on river easements and drainage channels. When rivers and canals fill with trash and concrete, even a smaller storm can cause urban creeks to backflow. In Metro Cebu's lowlands, half of the evacuation orders cited flash floods due to clogged drains, according to emergency reports. In short, the physical layout of the landscape was altered. Where there was once sponge-like forest, there is now pavement. Where a stream could spread out, there is now housing. Geologically, this means that more rain became surface runoff rather than seeping harmlessly into the ground. The earthquake that struck Cebu a month earlier made the islands more vulnerable in ways most people overlook. Although the September quake did not directly cause these floods, it forced old crack-prone structures into the open. Geologists from the Mines and Geosciences Bureau noted that the Tembla jolted fragile cast sinkholes and fractures in the rock, leaving cracks and subsidence. Days later, when the typhoon rains came, those newly loosened soils and pores would have let water speed through even faster. In some pockets of northern Cebu, the quake had already caused ground fissures. When Tino arrived, those fissures became canals for water to plunge underground or collapse suddenly. Officials had warned before Tino that these quake-weakened areas were at higher risk of rain, triggered landslides and floods. There were warnings. In the week before Typhoon Tino, the Mines and Geosciences Bureau had already dispatched teams to identify zones susceptible to flooding, rain-induced landslides, and ground subsidence in Cebu. They were focused on the karst lowlands, the caves, hollows, and old mine pits, where heavy rain would spell trouble. But the sheer volume of rain overwhelmed planning. With more than 100 flood control projects already built and billions spent around Cebu over the last decade, 
people assumed safety. Instead, the opposite happened. The modifications themselves influenced the outcome. Concrete levees on Kotkot and Mananga may have given a false sense of security, only for uncontrolled feeder streams from above to overflow via unprotected paths. In the end, the flood did what it had to, given the geological setup. In Liloan and Compostela, Kotkot Creek, dressed with fake embankments, still rose past the rooftops of homes. In Cebu City's Barangay Bacayan, the Butuanon River suddenly shifted course through the Villa del Rio subdivision, as if seeking an easier path, dragging cars and woodblocks along. The flood control walls crumbled or were bypassed by water coming off the hills. Everything pointed to geology, the island's ancient limestone and clay strata. The steep watershed profiles, the carved channels, all combined to turn rain into disaster. To be sure, climate and weather played the trigger role. Tropical cyclone Tino was an extraordinarily wet storm. But Cebu's response was dictated by deep time factors. Geologists emphasize that natural landscapes that remain forested and intact can generally withstand heavy rains up to a point. Conversely, a landscape with compromised bedrock and soils cannot. In Cebu, these underlying factors are clear in the records. After one typhoon in the year 1999, a hillside known as Cherry Hills Pitos above Cebu City collapsed under rain, killing dozens. That hillside, too, had fractured limestones and was newly developed at the time. Naga's 2018 tragedy showed what happens when the rock is coaxed to failure under deluge. Repeated warnings have said, if you weaken the mountains, they will let you know. In the immediate aftermath of Tino, officials scrambled to find a scapegoat. Some even pointed to substandard flood control projects. But geologists see a bigger story. The nation had spent 26 billion pesos on flood infrastructure in Cebu. And still, in the words of the governor, we are flooded to the max. The lessons now are clearly geological. Cebu's bald and weakened mountains can no longer buffer storms. Its numerous rivers, once meandering with slack, now thunder in narrow concrete canyons, easily overtopped. And its ground, riven by caves and quarry scars, can turn a heavy rain into a sinkhole or flash flood at a moment's notice. The takeaway, experts say, is that disasters here are not simply acts of nature. They are the expression of Cebu's fragile geology and our interaction with it. As one hazard specialist put it, this assessment will guide zoning and emergency planning for areas naturally prone to dissolution and collapse. In plain terms, the island itself warned us through these floods. The record is written in rock and soil. For every inch of rain, Cebu's mountains and riverbeds responded exactly as their geology dictated. Now comes the hard work of rebuilding. But if Cebu hopes to avoid another such calamity, it must rebuild not just homes and roads, but the health of its landscape. That means reforestation of denuded slopes, stringent control or outright bans on reckless quarrying, and ensuring waterways stay open. Only then can the next storm be met not by a tsunami of debris and water, but by gentle absorption into a healed land. For now, the question lingers on the lips of survivors, was this flood random? The science says no, it was engraved in stone, etched by Cebu's geology, and amplified by how we have treated that ground. If you enjoyed this deep dive into Cebu's hidden geological story, do not forget to like, share and subscribe to stay updated on more science-based disaster insights. Tap that hype icon to help the channel reach more curious minds and spread awareness. Every click helps build a smarter, safer community.